Are you in the process of doing your tax return and don't know exactly how to create your EUR and how to get the EUR figures into your tax return? Then you've come to the right place because we'll just go through the whole process together using Elser Online. Hi, my name is Melcher from Contest Tax Consulting. And if you're a freelancer, you always have to prepare an income surplus statement. So you're a Einzelunternehmer, but doing a Gewerbe, you also have to do a revenue surplus statement. If you make less than 60,000 euros profit per year and less than 600,000 euros turnover per year. In these cases, you always have to make an income surplus statement once a year to close your bookkeeping and then transfer these figures from the income surplus statement into the Annex EUR, and Elser Online is the best way to do this. When we want to create an Annex EUR, we start, as always, on the home screen of Elster Online. We log in, then we see our account, and then we go in the menu on the left side under Forms and Services on All Forms, and then in the third position we see the Income Surplus Statement, i.e. the EUR attachment. We open it with one click, and in the next step we can select the year. We now want to make the tax return for last year, so 2021, and click on Continue. In the next step, we have the option, as with all other forms, to take over the information from last year. You can see here that I haven't yet done an EUR with Elster Online. The transfer always makes sense if the master data has remained the same. Your address, your name and your profession don't change that often. It is worth transferring your data and then just to adjust the sales and expenses. If you do this for the first time, like me here, you simply click on Continue without data transfer. In the next step, you have to specify again what exactly you want to do. Because the Annex EUR is not just one document, or one piece of paper in the past, but consists of several. I don't want to go into all of them individually here, because that would take way too long. So I will only cover the points that will probably be sufficient for 95% of you. And that is the Annex EUR, which is the main form, the Income Surplus Statement, and then there is the Annex AV EUR, which is also part of it. AV stands for Anlagevermögen, so fixed assets. Whenever you have capital assets in your business that you have to depreciate over several years, you should also check the box for AV EUR here. All the other things, so Annex SZ, the Annex SE, the Annex AV SE, the Annex ER and LUF, you can simply omit in most cases and that's what I'm doing here because otherwise the video would be simply too long. By the way, the structure of the Annex EUR is the same as the structure of all other ELSER forms. You have three tabs at the top, one for data entry, one for checking, the ELSER online system checks whether what you have entered is plausible, and then, at the very end, you get an overview over your data again, and then you send the form to the tax office. On the left side, as always, you have this little dot. If you click on it, you can see the menu open up, so basically the structure of the form. And here, we see the Annex EUR and the Annex AV EUR, and we can see what we have to enter there. You can also jump to the individual items by clicking on the respective menu items. But let's get back to the data entry. When we start with the data entry, we can first enter the information, the data that we have entered in our Elser Online profile. I already explained in the overview video about Elser Online that you can enter your personal data, such as your name, address, tax number, etc. in Elster Online, so that you don't have to enter it separately for each form. That means that you simply take over the data that you have entered before. I didn't do that in this case, which is why I have to do this step by step. The first thing that is asked for is the tax number. Important at this point, here you will be asked for the tax number you have for your income tax, because the Annex EUR is part of the income tax return. Therefore, you have to use the tax number that you got for your income tax and not the one that you may have received for Gewerbe tax or UST tax. First you select the Bundesland, enter your tax number and then you will also see the responsible tax office. To get to the next step, you simply click on next page and on the next page we also see the structure so what we can also see on the left side here how the form is actually structured. If you don't have everything you can jump right in here and fill it out directly. But because I want to go through the form step by step from beginning to end I just click on next page here. Let's start as always with our personal data and what's important here 
What is the name of your company? I actually see mistakes relatively often because many solo self-employed people give themselves some kind of fantasy name. But if you're not registered in the commercial register as a sole proprietorship, you are not allowed to give yourself a fantasy name and your company is always called what you are called. So my company would be called Neumann. My first name would be Melchior and that is the name of my company. Of course, I can have a different name on my website, but for tax purposes, my name is also the name of the company. Then the street, house number, address, etc. You can do that without my help. The next point is more important and that is the different business year. I strongly advise against choosing a different fiscal year, but theoretically it is possible to change your fiscal year, i.e. the period in which you determine your profit and for which you make your surplus income statement. It's then not the same as the calendar year, which means for example that you make your surplus income statement on the 30th of June and not the 31st of December. This does not make sense in the vast majority of cases, however, there are a few exceptions where this can make sense. For example, in the case of companies that on the 31st of December are in the middle of their busiest season. For example, a ski resort hotel or a soccer club where the season runs from summer to summer. Now, if you're not a hotel and a ski resort and you're not a soccer club, honestly, just leave this blank here and stick with the option that the calendar year is also the business year. This whole thing saves you a considerable amount of work. In the next step, it's also important that you enter the type of business that is what you actually do. Here you can now enter nutritional consulting, life coaching, creation of YouTube videos or whatever. What's important, this of course should be consistent with what you indicated when you registered with the tax office. When you become self-employed, you fill out the questionnaire for tax registration and you have to enter that occupation here as well. In the next step, your legal form is important. Your legal form is that of the Einzelunternehmen. Here at the bottom, you can find, for example, the members of the liberal professions. These are the freelancers or other self-employed persons, which would be Gewerbetreibende, for example. I'll select member of the liberal profession for now. The next question is the type of income. And here you have three possibilities. Either you have a commercial enterprise, an agricultural and forestry business, or you have a self-employed occupation. Usually there are a lot of question marks on this topic because the distinction between commercial enterprise and freelance activity is always somehow confusing. And it's also a bit annoying that freelance work is always called self-employed work in the tax return and that the self-employed who are Gewerbetreibende have Einkünfte von Gewerbetreibenden. So there's always confusion there. If you're not sure what actually applies to you, take a look at the video I'm linking in the upper right corner. There I go into detail about what actually is the difference between a freelancer and a business. Also very important, the information here must of course match the information in the line above. This means that if I entered in line 6 that I'm a member of the liberal profession, my type of income is of course also self-employment. In the next step, you have to specify who actually owns this self-employment. In most cases, at least, if you are a solo self-employed, this should be the last option, so the taxable person. This means then that if I am self-employed, I am a taxable person and I am also the owner of my business. Then there is some information about whether you somehow stopped your business in that calendar year. For example, because you simply stopped being self-employed or because you sold your business. This should not apply to the vast majority of cases, but if it does apply to you, you can enter that here. And then we get to the tax number. And with the topic of tax number, there's always confusion. And even I get confused here because self-employed people can have several tax numbers, but they don't have to because you have a tax number for your private income tax. But if you work somewhere else than where you live, so if your business is registered somewhere else than where your residence is, you may have a second different tax number for your business tax type. This is also the tax number, so the business tax number which you had to enter in the previous step. But now you have to enter your private tax number for your income tax. For the tax office, it is of course important to know which business is currently doing the income surplus calculation. But it's also important for the tax office to know which income tax actually belongs to which private person and who actually owns the business. That is why you have to enter your private tax number again so that the tax office has this connection. In the next step, 
Step two, you have to indicate who helped you with your tax return. So in plain language, who is your tax advisor? You can almost always leave these fields empty because either you don't have a tax advisor and you have to deal with Elster online yourself, or you have a tax advisor and I hope for your sake that you then don't have to deal with Elster online, but your tax advisor does it for you. For example, if you're a client of ours, you don't need Elster online at all, then we will take care of everything. That's why actually, whichever case may be, whether you have help or don't have help, you almost never enter anything here. So we can just skip this step. The next step is much more interesting. It's about the operating income and the operating expenses. So how much cash did you make this year? That's broken down by different line items. What confuses a lot of people is that you leave most of the items blank because you usually just don't have most of these items. I also want to make an important point here. I see this all the time and I get a lot of questions about what is right and wrong because many self-employed people are afraid to write something in the wrong field. Of course, you can't put the turnover in the cost cost. That's relatively clear. But whether you categorize something as an office expense or a telephone expense, for example, that really doesn't matter. It has no influence on all your tax calculation. All that matters here is that you do it consistently. If you get a monthly recurring telecom bill, don't go back and forth between listing it as an office or a phone expense. That's always bad. Please book it uniformly and systematically. But beyond that, it doesn't make a difference where you place them on the list. Let's first have a look at the sales categories. The first one is operating income as a small entrepreneur for UST purposes. If you are a Kleinunternehmer, then you enter your sales here. You always have the possibility to add fields here as with all other fields. That means that if you have a different source of income or different types of what you make revenue with, you can list them here. For example, if I'm making YouTube videos, so I'm producing videos and I also hold on-site trainings, I can put that here. So video production. And with that, I made 5,000 euros last year. And now, however, I also did these on-site trainings because maybe what I'm doing in this video right now is also what I do on location and I get a fee for it, that could then be another type of income. And then I can just add another field here and write lectures, for example, and say I made 10,000 euros in revenue with that last year, and then I just confirm that. The big question here, of course, is how detailed should you actually make it? And here, there's no legal requirement. Of course, it is sometimes practical not to tell the tax office too much about your finances, which is why you can summarize it roughly. The problem is, however, that if you summarize it too roughly, you always run the risk that the tax office will ask you more questions afterwards and that you then might be exchanging a lot of emails or correspondence with the tax office because they want to understand what exactly you are doing. That's why I usually say summarize it roughly, but you should never have more than three or four items under sales and expenses respectively. If it doesn't make sense to break it down, just don't do it. It won't make it better or worse. That's why here the example as a Kleinunternehmer. There's also an additional area for Kleinunternehmer. I don't want to go into too much detail at this point. I have recorded a whole video series on the topic of the Kleinunternehmer Regelung, so there's a whole playlist for small business owners. Please feel free to have a look at it. I'll also link that in the top right corner and in the video description. So please check out those videos. Agriculture and forestry should not be of interest to most of you either. What most of you should have is sales taxable business income. That's all your normal income where you write an invoice and you charge Umsatzsteuer and you get paid for it. You enter all of that here, as I said, broken down as it makes sense. And then you may also have sales that are somehow UST exempt, where the recipient of the service might be abroad and where he then has to take care of the taxation. Maybe you got some form of Corona help. So there's also quite a few revenues here that don't quite fit. And for that, there's the next field. It says Umsatzsteuer or non-taxable operating income, including aid and grants due to the Corona pandemic, as well as operating income for which the recipient of the service owes Umsatzsteuer according to paragraph 13b Umsatzsteuergesetz. This is also known as reverse charge, where the service recipient owes the tax. If you don't know exactly what the reverse charge procedure is and whether it applies to you, take a look at the video description where I go deeper into that in a video.
so what it is and when you have to issue such an invoice. And you enter all of these sales here as well. Very important, you always enter the net amounts everywhere. Even for the business income subject to Umsatzsteuer, you only enter the net amounts because, and we will see this in the next point, the Umsatzsteuer received as well as the UST on free transfer of value is a separate item. This means that you enter the Umsatzsteuer in the next item because this is of course also part of your total sales. Another important point that I would like to discuss is the sale or withdrawal of fixed assets. Let's assume that you buy a smartphone. A smartphone has to be depreciated over several years. But now you realize after one year that the smartphone has not yet been depreciated, but it is also no longer sufficient and you sell it. So you sell it on eBay or whatever. Then you're selling assets and you are receiving money for them. These are also sales. They have nothing to do with your core business model, but they do count as revenue that your company generates and you have to enter them here. And then there's a very, very important topic. And this topic is underestimated by many people. And that is the service extraction for from a company. If your company has assets and you also use this service or these items privately, you have to pay tax on that. The most common example is the company car. If you have a company car, you have to pay tax on the private use. So the costs incurred by private use, just like income, like turnover, you have to pay tax on. There are several methods for determining the private share, i.e. for calculating how much you actually have to pay tax on, such as the logbook method or the 1% method. This would completely go beyond the scope of this video. I have a whole playlist on the subject of taxation of the company car or on on calculating the private usage share. So be sure to check that out. You'll find the whole playlist linked in the video description as well. And what applies to cars also applies to all other things. That means that if you have a smartphone, for example, and it's a company smartphone, and you also use it privately, then you also have to pay tax on this withdrawal of services, just like with the car. There too, of course, you have to calculate the share of use of your private use, and that is then your turnover or your withdrawal of services, and you enter that here. At the bottom, you have the total operating income. All the things we have just mentioned are your total turnover for a year. Now that we've added up all the sales and operating income, we get to the fun part, which is the operating expenses. Why is spending money fun? Well, because it reduces your profit and makes you pay less taxes. You see, I'm going to scroll through here very briefly. There are a lot of items here. And as I just said, it's not so important where you enter something. What's important is that you do it consistently the same way. So you're not constantly switching back and forth and jumping back and forth. And again, you don't have to explain each item individually across 20 different categories, but you just put it in your numbers. If it makes sense to bundle them up, then do that. If it doesn't, put it in multiple lines, but it doesn't have to be super detailed. Let's just go through the points together. I won't say much about every single point now because it's actually very, very much, but I will say a little bit about the most important points, which you should have heard about. The first one is the goods, raw materials, and supplies, including incidental costs. That means that if you're doing mail order, so you have to buy goods to sell them, you can enter that here. If you are in the service sector, so you don't trade, but I don't know, for example, create websites, you might also hire a designer and a programmer for individual tasks. These are then purchased services, for example, external services, which you can enter here. If you hire people because you say, there are so many activities where I need a designer all the time, maybe I'll just hire a designer, it's just cheaper for me, then that's expenses for your own staff. And there, also you add up all the expenses, so net salaries, insurance premiums, payroll taxes, etc. All of that in one sum then goes in here. The next point, which is also very important, is the Absetzung für Abnutzung, or simply depreciation. You don't have to, or you can't enter it here, because we will get into the AVEUR in a moment. If you've entered this correctly, these fields will be filled automatically. This means then that you can deduct from tax will be inserted automatically if we have filled out the AVEUR correctly. Especially the area of investments is an excellent way to save taxes. And there are some regulations written in paragraph 7G Income Tax Act. You don't necessarily have to know that it is paragraph 7G of the Income Tax Act, but you should definitely have heard of the investment deduction and the special depreciation. Both are great ways for you to save taxes. 
and I've done in-depth videos on both topics before. You can find them both below in the video description. So be sure to check those out if you feel like you've made a little too much profit this year and would like to pay less taxes. Of course, there are purchases that you do use long term and of course, there are things that you do use in your business long term, but you don't have to write them off because they cost less than 800 euros. Those are the so-called low value assets. For example, if I buy a mouse and a keyboard for 100 euros, I can just put that in here and then I don't have to depreciate it over several years. And then there's the whole range of costs. As I said, I'm not going into every single point now, but here, rent for business premises, rent for double household management, for example, telecommunications, accommodations and travel expenses, or even training costs. By the way, the item further training costs has been an item I have gotten a lot of questions about. If you have higher ongoing education expenses than usual or than customary, maybe because you're still doing a second, third, fourth or fifth degree and you want to book that as a business expense, you should definitely be more detailed about it because if you don't do it, the tax office will definitely ask about it. Then there are costs for legal, tax advice, accounting, for renting and leasing, etc. I don't think I need to say anything about each item individually now. Here you just enter the numbers one by one. But there are a couple of items that I would like to go into in more details. And that is down here the topic of limited deductible operating expenses. Or to be more precise, the parts that you can't deduct. Because you can't deduct all expenses from your taxes even if they're business related. I'll give you two examples. The first example is entertainment costs. If you go out to dinner with a business partner, you probably do that to get work from them or to discuss a project or something like that. You can deduct those expenses as well, but only at 70%. You can only claim 70% of your entertainment costs as a business expense. 30% are always non-deductible operating expenses. Why? Because the tax office says even if you talk to a business partner, you are still eating yourself. And eating is a private matter. And the Finanzamt simply assumes that the benefits of this business dinner are 30% eating and 70% acquiring new business or just business. That's why you can't deduct 30% of your entertainment expenses. Another business expense that you can't deduct, that can't reduce your profit and that cannot save you taxes are gifts to business partners over 35 euros. If you give away more than 35 euros per gift, per business partner, per year in gifts, you cannot deduct these costs from your taxes. Of course, you can still do this. From a business point of view, it might make sense, but from a tax point of view, it won't bring you any advantages. You do have to list those expenses here anyway. So here, non-deductible gifts, and here, the deductible gifts, the ones under 35 euros. Then, the entertainment costs, etc. Another important point, as I just said, eating is a private matter. It is. But if you work at trade shows for your business, at seminars, or wherever you travel, you do have to eat on the road. And eating out is usually more expensive than eating at home. This means that you incur additional expenses, additional costs for your meals, and there is a lump sum for additional catering expenses. Because you're on the road, you probably have higher costs related to your business, so it's no longer about eating, it's about the additional expense. And there are lump sums for that. You don't have to collect receipts at the snack bar, at the supermarket, at the restaurant, or wherever you get your food. But instead, if you are traveling for business, you have to document how long you were on the road, and then you can simply apply per diems. I also recorded an in-depth video on this. You can find that in the video description as well. And under that video, I got some interesting questions about where do you do all of this? Where do you actually enter this? The answer is right here. Extra meal expenses deductible. Here, you enter your additional expenses for meals for the corresponding year and these expenses will reduce your profit and thus save you taxes. Once we've entered it all, we have the total operating expenses at the bottom. First, we added up all the operating income, then we added up all the operating expenses and the result is your profit or loss. There are still some cosmetics, I would say, that can influence your profit again. However, for 90 to 95% of you, this is it and you've now determined your profit from your self-employment. But there are a couple of things that I would like to go over very briefly. In the vast majority of cases, you can skip these next few points. But if you formed an investment deduction amount in the last few years at some point, you have to dissolve this investment deduction. 
For more information, I'd like to refer you to the video I mentioned in the video description. But here, for example, you also have to release the investment deduction amounts from 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, or 2020. You can see that there are still quite a few fields here in which to write something in. But if you never created an investment deduction, leave it all blank. And then there are a few special features, especially if you hold shares in partnerships as business assets, for example, or also capital assets. Then you have to deal with the topic. But for the vast majority of you, these fields should not be interesting. And here at the very bottom, you see all of that listed again. And then at the very bottom, your taxable profit or loss. And that's what goes into your tax return, your income tax return. And that's the income that you have to pay taxes on. The next point is about reserves and hidden reserves, less interesting for most of you. What's actually more interesting is the whole fixed assets section, which is the AVEUR attachment. And as we saw before, the depreciation figures are of course relevant again for the Annex EUR. This should be relevant for most of you, so let's take a closer look at what we can specify here. For the fixed assets, I don't want to just click through each page now because to be honest, they almost all look the same. We'll just take a look at the different categories of fixed assets and then we'll just go through the different categories. The first category is land and land rights. If you buy land into your business assets, so if your business buys land, you have to include it as a fixed asset. What you can also buy as a business asset is your home office. For example, if you buy a house and you use a room as your office, then your home office can be included in your business assets even though the rest of the house is effectively your personal property. There are some disadvantages to that though, but I wanted to at least let you know of the possibility. What should be the case much more often is the third category and that is intangible assets. These are all assets that you can't physically touch, such as licenses, fees, etc. Personally, I've had some intangible assets in my accounting and those were domains. When I bought a domain, that was the right to use that name. And some of the domains I bought from someone else cost a few thousand euros and I had to capitalize that somehow as a fixed asset. And those are classic intangible assets. But what should be by far the most common, also in your case, are the movable assets without GWG, so without low value assets. These are all assets that you can somehow move, even if it takes a bit more effort to move them. For example, you can move your smartphone, a camera, a light fixture, your desk, your car, all of those things. Your home office, it's in a building. Obviously you can't move that because you can't move your property. So anything that's movable in any way is a movable asset. And I assume that that's the bulk of it as well. Then there's collective items. That topic is also way beyond the scope at this point. So again, have a look at the video in the video description. And then of course, you can have financial assets. That means that you as a company can also have operating assets, meaning you as a company can hold shares in a GmbH, for example. That's a financial asset. Or current assets. Since the most common category for you will be movable assets, let's just take a look at that. You can already see the most common categories. So automobiles. For example, you can't put your VW Golf or Tesla Model XYS or whatever here with the date of acquisition or production or with its value of contribution. You can enter the book value at the beginning of the profit determination period. Of course, this sounds a bit pompous, but the beginning of the profit determination periods means the accounting value on January 1st. And you need to know how much value your Tesla or your VW Golf has lost in that year. To do this, of course, you need to know the value on the 1st of January of a year to then look at how much it has lost in value and how much it is worth on December 31st. I think it's obvious then that the value on January 1st of the following year is the same as that. Then you can think about whether there have been some additions. I'm not 100% sure, but I think with Teslas, if you bought upgrade packages, you might have to activate those. You can't use that, but it increases the value of your car. That means that your asset value, your Tesla, suddenly has increased in value. You would have to enter that here as well. Then there's the special depreciation, which I mentioned before. 
than the very normal AFA, so the Absetzung für Abnutzung, depreciation, any disposals, because something might no longer be there, and then you have the book value at the end of the profit determination period. That's the result, basically, which is then, again, the value for the next year. Then you have office equipment here, where you can enter your printer, your smartphone, your desk, and so on. And there's another category called Other. But you can see that the structure is the same everywhere. And the nice thing is that if you use Elster on Online and enter your fixed assets there completely, you don't need any separate Excel lists or any other records because you can always click on the data transfer from the previous year when creating the EUR attachment. You have the data in the following year and then only have to adjust the figures that are correct for that year. No more separate Excel lists. You can do all of this with Elster Online. I hope that I've brought you a little clarity with this video. You now know how to get your income statements into your tax return and then send them to the tax office. But if you think to yourself, I am not a tax expert, I want to do my job and not do my tax return all the time, I'll let a tax advisor do that for me, then you're absolutely right. Why don't you look for a specialized online tax consultant, especially for freelancers and self-employed people? And I also have a great tip for you. We are one and we will gladly help you prepare your EUR and and send it to the tax office, of course. I'll link all the information about our services here. Also have a look at the other videos on this channel, such as this one or this one.